Welcome to this United States History Lecture. This one is entitled The Indians West. We're going to take a look at the native peoples of the West and try to understand how they encountered those people invading the West after the Civil War, how they adapted and survived, uh, and try to explain what was going on with U.S. government policy toward them. The target for this lecture is 6.02. Let's start with American Indian policy. In many ways, the policies that you see coming from the U.S. government, a lot of them reject Indians. They reject the idea of someone being an Indian. But at the same time, you also see policies that try to civilize Indians, which implies accepting native peoples, even though you want them to change. And the US government seems to go back and forth on these two ideas. Sometimes they're more aggressive at getting Indians out of the way. Sometimes uh, there's a desire to civilize and reform the Indians that takes hold. When you see rejecting policies, you see a lot of emphasis on taking land, particularly if that land has gold or silver or metals on it. The more a piece of property has a value that can be um, easily exploited, the more you will see policies that take Indians um, away from that land and move them somewhere else, or sometimes kill them to get them out of the way. Policies that reject Indians tend to see lots of attacks on natives. So uh, actual physical violence against native peoples. Many of the people who rejected Indians whether they were part of the U.S. government or just someone living in a, in a state or territory, part of their thinking was that Indians will always be Indian and there's nothing that can be done to make them like Americans or to make them worthwhile living next to. On the other side, the civilizing impulse tends to teach Indians white ways. We saw this in an earlier lecture back in um, our second unit um, with farming, teaching the Indians how to farm, teaching them how to write, teaching them Christianity. The assumption is um, that they just need white culture. Very often the civilizing approach suggests that Indians need to be put on reservations. Um, not only does it get them out of the way of white settlers who can take the land and farm it or get the uh, metals out of the land, but it means that Indians can be collected together where someone can go watch them and teach them and supervise them um, and help them civilize. The core belief then is that Indians can be civilized they can be saved from their so-called savagery and made into something that appears to be more like a white person. Um, as one reformer at this time said, we want to kill the Indian and save the man inside. So if we could just get their Indian culture out of the way, we could rescue them. Um, both policies they tend to go back and forth. Sometimes more rejection is seen, sometimes more civilizing is seen, and the U.S. Um, doesn't have a consistent approach um, policy-wise until more recent times. Which is better? Well, I don't know. That's kind of a loaded question. Rejecting means probably killing you or eliminating you, Civilizing you would mean to d decide that the thing that makes you who you are is not acceptable and it needs to be driven out. So neither policy 
is particularly good if you are a native person. In the 1880s, there was a renewed push at making native peoples more like white Americans. That, as we've talked about before, is an assimilationist idea. Assimilate means to make you like something else. See the word uh, simil in there, like similar, to make you similar? Well, the policy that was created to make Indians white, to assimilate them, um, to force them to adopt white culture, to make them act white or to um, behave in white ways, was called the Dawes Act, 1887. This Dawes Act was intended to save native peoples. And the people behind it thought that they were doing a good thing by civilizing Indians and driving the Indianness out of them. What the Dawes Act did was to end reservations. The thought was reservations allowed Indians to stay together, so it just preserved their Indian culture. They spent too much time with other Indians, and they never really got over their Indianness. So what really needs to happen is they need to be put on individual plots of land and made to farm. So here you go, Mr. Indigenous person. Here's 160 acres. We're gonna separate you from your people. You're gonna learn to farm. And eventually you will no longer be Indian. That part of you will be driven out. It failed. It failed for several reasons. For one, Indians got cheated out of their 160 acres of land, and they lost millions of acres to unscrupulous um, land speculators. Second, many of them did not come from cultures where farming was important, and to farm was not part of their background. Plus, it's the West. We know what farming is like in the West. 40% of people who tried out for the Homestead Act um, made it. The other 60% did not. So to put Indians in the same position of farming in a difficult place is going to set them up for not making it. In fact, if you look at native cultures in the West, they evolved to fit the environment of the West. And it made sense for the Western environment. Farming didn't make sense for them. So the Dawes Act, even though it tried to make Indians assimilate white culture to be farmers, it actually failed and made the situation worse for native peoples. The goal of the assimilationists was to take a young man like this and turn him into the man on the right. This is uh, the same guy. Um, he's been civilized. So gone are the markers of his Indian identity. And it's been replaced by a suit and a tie and a haircut to turn him into something that is not Indian. And notice how much whiter he seems to be. I don't know if this is a trick of the camera or a trick of the lighting, but it's almost as if you look at this person um, and you see he's been almost literally whitewashed to become closer to what Americans thought um, should be done with Indians. Some Indians resisted. They did not want to give up their culture. They did not want to give up their ways. They felt like they were being asked to sacrifice their identities for something that didn't fit who they were. 
And there was a, a revival of Indian religion in the 1890s called the Ghost Dance Movement. The native peoples who pushed this movement are very similar to what uh, Tecumseh's brother, Tenskwatawai, was doing um, before the War of 1812, saying to native peoples, revive your traditions, uh, reject the white man's ways, embrace your Indianness, and take up the ghost dance. This was a return to a traditional Indian faith to escape white men's control. In the ghost dance, natives danced in a way that would believe, they believed would protect them from attack, would restore their faith, it would let the spirits fight on their behalf. It would bring them prosperity, bring them unity. Um, it was done in a circle. So it tended to uh, draw people together. It would unify them um, as they were resisting uh, the assimilation of the Dawes Act. The United States Army heard about this movement and they interpreted it as a, some kind of secret conspiracy to attack the U.S. And what the U.S. Army was afraid of is that this was some prelude to a new series of wars, that all these Indians were going to go stance and then suddenly rise up and try to exterminate Americans. So the U.S. Army stopped the movement at the Battle of Wounded Knee, South Dakota in 1890. Um, about 300 Native peoples were killed, men, women, and children, by the U.S. Army. And it became a, an event that Native peoples would never forget as a symbol of the horrific violence done against Native peoples. By the US government. Here are people doing the ghost dance. Uh, this is a modern illustration of the ghost dance. Um, the belief was the spirits would fight on your behalf, they would protect you um, as you were uh, working together to embrace traditional faith. Uh, but it did not work out in the end for Native folks, just like it didn't work out for Tecumseh and Tenskwatawai, since the government used its power to crush these people. Another way that uh, Native peoples were pushed to assimilate was through boarding schools. And this was particularly for children of Native peoples who sometimes were given up by their parents, sometimes they were taken um, from their parents and sent to schools where they would be trained to become white. Um, the 1870s and 1880s, um, you start to see these boarding schools pop, pop up. Um, the most well-known one is in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, so not far from here. The children would be taught white culture and white values. They were forced to go to church to learn to read and write. Um, they were punished if they spoke their native languages. They had to wear white clothing. In essence, um, these schools were created to take these children and turn them into white folks in the making. By 1902, about 6,000 children were enrolled um, in these programs, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes by force, and they were made to give up their Indian, um, their Indian-ness, and sometimes often beaten out of them by force um, by the people who ran these schools. The schools also profited off these kids' labor. They worked them 
um, in, in order to teach them discipline and um, the value of hard work. Um, so in some ways, it's a little bit like um, a kind of enslavement in some of these schools. So here is a kid um, who would be taken to one of those schools, and this is what he is expected to become, to walk away from his Indian identity and become part of an American identity, a white identity. I'm going to leave you in this lecture with um, the words of a famous uh, chief, uh, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce Indians, um, who lived um, in the west, the northwest part of the United States. Um, and they got into conflict with the U.S. Army um, and decided to flee to Canada to escape uh, being put on a reservation but were caught uh, by the U.S. Army and then forced uh, onto a reservation. And this is supposedly the speech that Chief Joseph made. I think it summarizes how many Native peoples feel in the 19th century. Even though these might not exactly be his words, um, it's hard to know um, for sure if the person writing them down got them correctly. I think many Native peoples like Chief Joseph would agree with the phrase, I am tired of fighting. Our chiefs are killed. Looking Glass is dead. Tuhuhutsotse is dead. The old men are dead. It is the young men who say yes or no. He who led the young men is dead. It's cold and we have no blankets. The little children are freezing to death. My people, some of them have run away to the hills and have no blankets, no food. No one knows where they are, perhaps freezing to death. I want to have time to look for my children and see how many I can find. Maybe I shall find them among the dead. Hear me, my chiefs. I am tired. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever.